good morning. Welcome to West Ark this morning. It's good to see everybody here. Uh, we're going to jump right in with our, our lesson about the, the life and writings of the Apostle Paul. Uh, you can see on the screen today we're going to be talking about Paul and his travel to Rome. Uh, this brings us to the end of the account in the, the book of Acts, but we still have quite a bit to talk about with Paul after this week. Uh, we've still got about half his letters that we haven't covered yet, uh, and we need to figure out if, if the end of Acts is the end of Paul uh, or if uh, he's going to continue beyond the end of the book. It's not clear. Uh, but I think for this week, we're going to be talking about uh, Paul and his trip to Rome. Just to refresh you on what we talked about last week, uh, Paul had been working on this collection, uh, and uh, the churches throughout the, the Gentile world have been contributing, saving up money each week, and now he has collected all that money, and this, this group has traveled with him, and you know, this large sum of money, uh, and delivered it to Jerusalem, where the, the Christians there have received it. Uh, but Paul was uh, presented by the, the elders in Jerusalem with this, this issue that they were concerned about, that uh, people, you know, he, Paul has developed this reputation of being uh, anti-Jewish, anti-law. Uh, he's telling Jews to stop following the law. And they, they, the Christians there want to, to make it clear that that's not what Paul's teaching, uh, and that Paul still follows the law. Uh, so they suggest that he go to the temple as part of this vow, uh, when he does go to the temple, he's seized by a mob. Uh, they, they claim that he has brought Gentiles into the, the temple, uh, which was not true. Uh, but the, the Romans, realizing things are getting out of hand, just grab Paul uh, and are trying to figure out uh, what to do with him. Uh, they, they know there's some problem with Paul, uh, but they can't figure out if it's a Roman problem uh, or not. Uh, so that's where he is right now. He's in the custody of Rome, he's been transferred by military escort from Jerusalem to Caesarea, which is really the, the Roman administrative capital, uh, since it's not, you know, right there on the coast and easy to get in and out. Uh, so that's where uh, the, the Roman officials are. Uh, so he is now in Caesarea. Uh, this week we're going to be talking about a few trials of Paul. So first we have the trial before uh, the procurator Felix. This will be in Acts 24. Uh, Felix is going to leave office, be replaced by uh, Portius Festus, the next procurator. Uh, and so Paul also gets a trial before him. Uh, and then it's not really a trial, uh, but there's an additional hearing uh, b before Festus again, but this time uh, the Jewish king, King Herod Agrippa. Uh, and so that will be you know, sort of a, an official court proceeding for, for Paul again. So that's Acts 26. Uh, and then 27 and 28 will be Paul going to Rome. Uh, so we, we should be able to cover all five chapters and finish the book of Acts today is my goal. Uh, so we're going to start in Acts 24. Uh, so Paul has just been transferred there by military escort. Five days later, the high priest Ananias went down to Caesarea with some of the elders and a lawyer named Tertullus, and they brought their charges against Paul before the governor. When Paul was called in, Tertullus presented his case before Felix. Okay. Well, let's first talk about Felix here. Uh, his full name, Antonius Felix, the, the procurator of Judea, uh, for several years. Uh, we don't know the exact dates, but probably from around 52 to 59, maybe 60. Uh, maybe he ended a little earlier. Uh, so procurator is basically like a, the, the governor of Judea. Uh, so remember at this time, Judea uh, is not really an independent nation anymore. It's, it's ruled by the Romans. Uh, the Jews have a king, uh, but the king is really uh, doing what the Romans ask him to do. Uh, so they are an occupied nation, and Felix is the, the occupying governor of the Roman province, uh, maybe it's not a province, of Judea. Uh, Felix is a freed slave. Uh, and you think, well, you know, surprising that a freed slave could rise to such a position. 
uh, but he was a, a slave of the emperor. Uh, and so when you're the slave of an emperor and you get freed, uh, you've got pretty good connections. And so his, uh, he's able to, to be appointed as procurator. Uh, he's remembered from history as cruel and corrupt. And I, the, the Acts account, uh, I think, goes along with that. Uh, so I'm trying to decide if it's probably not worth it to be so famous that you are talked about 2,000 years later if what you're being talked about for is being cruel and corrupt. Uh, but that's how he is remembered by history. And we'll, like I said, we'll see in Acts how that comes up. Married three times, it also tells you a little bit that this guy's a winner. Uh, twice to women named Drusilla. I don't, I'm, maybe I'm uh, more surprised by this than I should be. How do you find two women named Drusilla and marry both of them? Maybe it's more common. I, I haven't met any Drusilla, so I don't know. Uh, but Drusilla number two is the current uh, Mrs. Felix uh, at the time of Acts, uh, and she is a Jew. Uh, she is the daughter of Herod Agrippa I, uh, the sister of Herod Agrippa II. Well, we'll get into the Herods a little bit later, too. Uh, so it, it means that, uh, and uh, Luke tells us in Acts, Acts as well, that Felix understands a little bit about uh, Jewish culture, Jewish religion, and about Christianity, thanks to having uh, a Jewish wife. And, and, you know, he's been there several years as well. It's a, it's a contrast we see for Festus. Festus arrives, and he really doesn't know anything about what uh, this situation's about. Uh, Felix has a son with Drusilla, uh, Drusilla number two, uh, named Marcus Antonius Agrippa, uh, who makes the unfortunate decision to move to the island of Pompeii. Uh, if you remember from your history classes, uh, in the first century, uh, Mount Vesuvius erupts and buries the city of Pompeii in ash, uh, and uh, their son died in that uh, eruption. Uh, but that, a little personal note about Antonius Felix. Uh, the, the trial before Felix, so the, the, the prosecuting side makes their case first. They have a lawyer. Uh, I'm not going to say anything bad about lawyers. We have some lawyers in the room today, so I won't uh, make any lawyer jokes. Uh, but his case basically runs like this. Uh, point number one, uh, Felix is awesome. Uh, Felix is really, really great. Uh, we want you to know we really appreciate what you've done for our nation, which is pretty rich coming from an occupied uh, state. Uh, maybe we should just read this. So t Acts 24, verses 2 and 3. Uh, Tertullus starts with this. We, we have enjoyed a long period of peace under you, and your foresight has brought about reforms in this nation. Everywhere and in every way, most excellent Felix, we acknowledge this with profound gratitude. Now, the, the truth is that the Jewish people have been in a, basically a constant state of revolt for the last hundred years, uh, against the occupying Romans, uh, they do not appreciate uh, the, the period of peace that, that Felix has brought, uh, the, the reforms that he has brought their nation. This is uh, just, uh, I don't know what the word is for it, but it, it's, it's not true. This is a lawyer speaking, I guess. Uh, so they start with that, just to uh, warm him up a little bit. Uh, point number two. Uh, Paul's guilty of being a troublemaker everywhere, uh, which I don't know what, what the, the crime of troublemaking is, if that's like disturbing the peace or what it is. Uh, he doesn't get into too many specifics here. Uh, and point number three, he desecrated the temple, which uh, back in Jerusalem, that was the big charge that they had against Paul. It wasn't true, uh, but they also kind of recognize, I think, here that uh, Felix probably doesn't care about the temple. Um, and so that one kind of gets bumped down to the end. And it's more about, uh, you know, being a troublemaker. That is the main charge against Paul. Paul gets to, to speak in his defense. And he, he makes it clear, I, I wasn't causing any problems uh, in the temple, anywhere in Jerusalem. Um, I, I was at the temple worshiping. And uh, it was these other people who stir up this crowd. And he, he actually says, you know, I worship the same God they do, uh, but I do it as a follower of the way, uh, which is an interesting term we, we maybe don't use enough today. 
Uh, but we have it here. We have it again in just the next verse, I think, uh, talking about the, the followers of Christ as the way. Uh, so that's uh, Paul's defense before Felix. Well, Felix, who was well acquainted with the way, adjourned the proceedings. When Lysias, the commander, comes, he said, I'll decide your case. He ordered the centurion to keep Paul under guard, but to give him some freedom and permit his friends to take care of his needs. Now, Lysias is the guy who, uh, when Paul was in the temple, this was the Roman commander who pulled him out of the mob uh, and kept trying to, to figure out what to do with him. Was, he was the one who uh, asked Paul about his citizenship uh, when he was going to flog him. Uh, so that, that's Felix's excuse, is he's going to wait for Lysias to come. Uh, several days later, Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish. He sent for Paul and listened to him as he spoke about faith in Christ Jesus. As Paul talked about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix was afraid. Uh, this tells you a little bit about uh, the character of Felix. Uh, when, when he starts hearing preaching about self-control and judgment, that's, that's not what he wants to hear. Uh, that's enough for now. You may leave, he tells Paul. When I find it convenient, I'll sin, sin for you. At the same time, he was hoping that Paul would offer him a bribe. So he sent for him frequently and talked with him. Now, here's an interesting, like, from what we know of, of the rest of Paul's life, he doesn't appear to be a wealthy individual. Uh, and so why does Felix think he's going to get some sum of money from Paul? Well, we, we didn't mention it in Paul's defense, uh, but he, he did mention uh, that the reason he came to Jerusalem was to make this offering. Uh, and he has just presented this sizable sum of money to the Christians in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know if Felix knows any more than, than what Paul just said, uh, but he, he knows Paul either has money or he has friends with money uh, and thinks that maybe uh, that could be his own benefit. Uh, so once again, uh, Felix showing uh, how he is remembered in history as being cruel and corrupt. Uh, is he's uh, mostly interested in a bribe here. Uh, two years pass with Paul in prison in Caesarea, and Felix was succeeded by Portius Festus. But because Felix wanted to grant a favor to the Jews, he left Paul in prison. Uh, so you get a hint, a hint here of the uh, Roman justice system. Uh, is not so concerned about individual justice. Uh, that Paul, the Roman citizen, it's not Felix's concern if he gets a fair trial, uh, if he gets charged with any crime. Uh, his main concern is, let's keep things under control. We don't want to cause problems. And as long as Paul is in prison, people are happy. Uh, so this actually I mean, this kind of reminds you of how things go with Jesus as well, uh, where Pontius Pilate, who's the, the governor at the time, uh, his choice is not about justice for Jesus. His, his thought is, this is going to cause problems. I'm not going to get in this situation. Uh, I'm not going to make people unhappy. My job is to keep the peace. And if some people have to suffer uh, for that peace, uh, that's in the best interest of Rome. There's a similar story with Felix here. Uh, that Paul, a Roman citizen, uh, is left in prison for two years uh, with no charges, uh, no further trial, uh, just so it doesn't upset the Jews and it makes his life easier. Well, this new guy, Portius Festus. Uh, so uh, this governor position, it's appointed by Rome uh, and so uh, Festus is the, the latest appointee. He said this is around the year 59 AD. Uh, and because he's new in town, he, he doesn't know anything about Judaism or Christianity. Uh, but he, 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 you know, he's off, he's, he's starting a new job here. He wants to get off to a good start with his co-workers. Uh, so he's uh, eager to, to try to, to figure things out. So right away, uh, you know, his third day in town, uh, he goes from Caesarea to Jerusalem, and there the, the Jewish leaders find him and say, you know what, uh, you've got this guy Paul, uh, he's in prison in Caesarea, and could you bring him to Jerusalem uh, for a trial? And Festus says, well, that's, that's good, I, I 
should, we shouldn't leave, be leaving people in prison without a trial. Uh, really, their plan is that as Paul is being moved from Caesarea to Jerusalem, is that they're going to ambush him on the way and try to kill him before he ever gets to any kind of trial. Uh, but Festus says, well, well let's, he's, in, he's in Caesarea. I'm going to be in Caesarea. So let's start in Caesarea with the trial there and see if he's willing to come to Jerusalem. Uh, so this is our second trial now with the, the second uh, procurator, uh, Portius Festus. Uh, so that it begins, Paul comes in, and the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him. They brought many serious charges against him, but they couldn't prove them. Then Paul made his defense. I've done nothing wrong against the Jewish law or against the temple or against Caesar. Okay, his, his story is the same as the first time. Uh, but Festus, wishing to do the Jews a favor, said to Paul, well, are you willing to go up to Jerusalem and stand trial before me there on these charges? Now, this is the idea that the Jewish leaders had planted in Festus's mind. Paul said, well, I'm standing before Caesar's court right now where I ought to be tried. I've not done anything, any wrong to the Jews, as you yourself know very well. If, however, I'm guilty of doing anything deserving death, I don't refuse to die. But if the charges brought against me by these Jews aren't true, no one has the right to hand me over to them. I appeal to Caesar. Well, as a Roman citizen, he has the right uh, to take his case before Caesar. Uh, this is not, not for every case. Uh, if you're you know, accused of stealing or something, I don't think you get to, to waste the emperor's time with that. Uh, but for, for this kind of case, uh, he has the right as a Roman citizen to go to Caesar. After Festus had conferred with his council, he declared, you have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. Now, last week we played a little game called Good Choice, Bad Choice, where we get to, to second guess Paul's decision making uh, in this part of his life. Uh, because uh, he is an inspired writer, uh, I don't question anything he's writing, uh, but sometimes the, the characters in Scripture are not necessarily role models uh, for us. They, they don't always make perfect decisions. And so let's, you know, we can think about Paul here uh, and think about his decision-making. Was this a good choice or a bad choice to appeal to Caesar? Now, if we skip ahead a little bit, we have this conversation with, with Festus and Agrippa, uh, the king of the Jews. Uh, they, they, they start talking and say, well, this man is not doing anything that deserves death or imprisonment. The king says to Festus, this man could have been set free if he hadn't appealed to Caesar. So we think, oh man, Paul, if you only you hadn't appealed to Caesar, you would have been free. Uh, so it seems like, well, maybe this is maybe not the best decision. But we do, do remember, uh, Festus is, wasn't going to set him free. He was going to send him to Jerusalem. And the plan was to kill him before he gets to Jerusalem. Uh, so the, the, the choices really weren't appeal to Caesar or be set free. Uh, the, the choices were appeal to Caesar or get sent to Jerusalem, perhaps being killed along the way. And even standing before the, the Jews would not have given Paul as fair a, a hearing as he gets from Rome. Uh, I think he's, he's certain that he's not going to get uh, a fair trial from the Jewish just, justice system. Uh, but as a Roman citizen, he at least has a chance with Rome. Uh, so far, I mean, that's been the, the case throughout his life. When he has gotten in trouble, Rome has got him out of it. Uh, he's you know, suffered a little bit, uh, but uh, it's worked out before. Uh, so maybe this, is, this seems like perhaps a good decision, I think. And the other thing is he, he, he told... Uh, the church in Rome, it's been over two years now, where he said, I'm hoping to visit there on my way to Spain. That's what he wrote in the letter to the Romans. Uh, and now he's been sitting in prison for two years and wondering, I think, you know, is that actually going to happen? Uh, is, is my plan to go to Rome just completely done? Am I going to spend the rest of my life here in prison? 
Uh, so I think he's, he's thought through, uh, if things start going poorly in Caesarea, he's got this card that he can play, and it works out to, to still achieve his goals of going to Rome. Uh, not maybe under the best circumstances, he's, he'd be going as a prisoner, uh, but he would, he would get uh, further along on his plan that way. Uh, so I think, I think it's a good choice given the options that he had. And I don't, I don't think we should uh, worry too much about Agrippa's comment that he could have been set free. Uh, that doesn't seem to be the choice that he really had. Uh, so I'm, I'm okay with this choice. Uh, here we, I'm going to look up a little bit here on a, a translation discussion. Uh, a few days later, King Agrippa and Bernice arrived at Caesarea to pay their respects to Festus. And let me ask you, who is Bernice? If you were just reading this, uh, who is Bernice? I think most of us, most English speakers who read this, would assume that Bernice is Agrippa's wife, that she is the queen if he's the king, uh, and that mentioning these two names together uh, indicates that they are married. Uh, in this case, that's actually not the, the correct answer. Uh, Bernice is Agrippa's sister, uh, and they, or they're still kind of, as the royal family, moving together. So I'm thinking as a, I think a lot about translation, Bible translation, uh, and you, you find like in the New Living Translation that they clarify this, uh, and they add the words, his sister, uh, knowing that most English speakers are going to read this and assume that they're married. Uh, and so to prevent people from making the wrong assumption and misunderstanding the text, they have added in words to help people get the correct meaning uh, because you know, we're less familiar with you know, the first century political system uh, and just the way English functions with you have a man, male's name and a woman's name right next to each other, we assume they're married. Uh, I think it's an interesting translation question. It, it, it helps me to think about it on one of these sort of non-important verses, because uh, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but the same kind of translation philosophy is going to influence other places where it is you know, a bigger deal for should we be adding in words to Scripture in our translation if it helps people make the, to understand the text better? Or do we leave the text the way it is and let people perhaps misunderstand it, and it's up to the Bible teachers to correct those misunderstandings? Uh, so here, I think it's a, a nice place where it, nobody really cares about Agrippa and Bernice, uh, but it shows the difference between the, the New Living Translation's philosophy of we want people to understand the Bible, even if that means we need to, to add things into it to clarify the meaning. Uh, verse, you know, the NIV is more in the middle, but anything further to the, that side than NIV is not going to add in words. They're going to say, Scripture, we don't change anything about Scripture, uh, which you know, we're translating. That's uh, still a big change, I'd say. But uh, we're not going to add in words to to change, to clarify the meaning. That's up to you and your teachers to understand the meaning. Just something to think about here uh, as you think about your Bible translations. Uh, anyway, uh, Agrippa and his sister Bernice are going to go visit Portius Festus. Remember, Festus is, this is still his first week on the job. Uh, so now he's meeting uh, the Jewish king. Uh, this is actually Agrippa II, Herod Agrippa II, and maybe we need to, to remind ourselves about the, the Herods. I, I get him confused, and so I need to make a little chart here uh, to keep him straight myself, because there's four different Herods in the New Testament. Uh, the first one is Herod the Great. Uh, it, it depends on who you ask if you think he's the, the great or not. Uh, he thought he was the great, uh, but he's the one, you'll remember, who killed the baby boys in Jerusalem, uh, or in, in Bethlehem, at the time of the birth of Jesus. Uh, and then uh, 
the family of Jesus flees to Egypt, and until he dies, stay in Egypt. When, when Herod the Great dies, they return back to uh, Judea. Uh, his son is Herod Antipas. So in the Gospels, when we read about the story of John the Baptist uh, criticizing Herod uh, and Herod uh, having John killed, uh, this is the second Herod, Herod Antipas. And even at, at the trial of Jesus, uh, this is the Herod that is in, at that part of the story. Well, then he, he also dies. Uh, the third one is Herod Agrippa, Herod Agrippa I. So at the beginning of Acts, this is the guy who is on the scene. Uh, he's a grandson of Herod the Great, uh, but not a son of Herod Antipas. He's a nephew of Herod Antipas. Uh, so if you remember the story in Acts, um, this is around Acts 8, uh, he kills uh, James, the son of Zebedee, or the apostle James, uh, and then imprisons Peter to do the same thing. Uh, Peter's uh, released from prison miraculous, miraculously, and, and Acts says that he is uh, eaten by worms, uh, which I'm not sure what that is, uh, because he failed to give glory to God. Uh, and so that's the end of Herod Agrippa I. Now his son is Herod Agrippa II. Uh, and at this point in Acts, they just call him Agrippa, uh, but he's really the second. Uh, so at the trial of Paul is Herod Agrippa II and his sister Bernice. Okay? So these, you know, remember these names when you, when you encounter a Herod in the New Testament. It's actually four different Herods, uh, who are the kings of the Jews, uh, but kings that are really doing the bidding of the Romans, not independent uh, kings. So, uh, Agrippa and Bernice come to visit Festus, and, and Festus starts talking to them about Paul. Remember, this is supposed to be about Paul. I got a little off track. I'm sorry. Uh, Festus said, I, I don't really get what the problem is about Paul. Uh, they, it seems to be that these guys say Jesus is dead, Paul says Jesus is alive, and I don't see why it matters, um, but I'm supposed to send Paul to Caesar, and I have to have something to, to charge him with to send him to Caesar. I can't just uh, send him there with, with no case against him. Uh, could you help me you know, figure out something to, to charge him with here? And Agrippa says, well, I, actually, I would like to hear Paul myself, so sure. And, you know, maybe we can, we can figure out uh, what crime he's committed. Uh, so uh, Paul gets this special hearing before King Agrippa uh, and Bernice and Festus. Uh, he, he, he goes through here uh, the story of becoming a Christian. This is the third time we've had it in Acts. I'm not going to get into it uh, on this uh, this time. Uh, but I think it's interesting. He, he, you know, the, Festus was trying to figure out, there's something here about resurrection, about is Jesus alive or not? Uh, he keeps hearing that. And if you, you listen to Paul long enough, you, you start to realize this is a pretty crucial part. Every time he speaks is getting, about, getting to the resurrection of Jesus. Uh, and so, uh, when he's speaking to Agrippa here, he says, you know, why should any of you consider it incredible that God raises the dead? So, and just kind of remember some of these other occurrences. Back in, in Athens, uh, Paul is telling these Athenian philosophers about the gospel uh, and uh, gets to the point where uh, Jesus is proven to be uh, God's agent who will judge the world by the fact that he has been raised from the dead. Uh, and this basically ends his speech in Athens uh, because when they hear about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. Uh, others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. What we realize is in the Greco-Roman world, there's no, no place for resurrection. That, that doesn't fit their worldview. Uh, people die, they go to the underworld, uh, 
there's no conception of being raised from the dead for, for the Greco-Roman worldview. And so they, they just, they laugh at this. When he talks about resurrection, uh, they think this is just crazy talk that doesn't make any sense. Uh, when Paul is uh, on trial before the Sanhedrin, you know, his only thing he says there is, I'm on trial because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. So once again, his, his main thing is resurrection. Uh, Acts 25, so this is uh, before Festus the first time. I have the same hope in God as these men themselves have, that there will be a resurrection of both the righteous and the wicked. So once again, resurrection. Uh, God has helped me to this very day. I stand here and testify to small and great alike. I'm saying nothing beyond what the prophets and Moses said would happen, that the Messiah would suffer and as the first to rise from the dead would bring the message of light to his own people and to the Gentiles. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. Now remember, Festus, the Roman, doesn't understand resurrection. He says, you are out of your mind, Paul. Your great learning is driving you insane. Uh, it appears it's this resurrection that is, is at least part of this that he doesn't understand. Uh, he thinks Paul is crazy. And Paul says, no, I, I'm not insane, most excellent Festus. What I'm saying is true and reasonable. And the king, who's a Jew, uh, is familiar with these things. and I can speak freely to him. I'm convinced that none of this has escaped his notice because it wasn't done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you do. Uh, Agrippa said to Paul, do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me to be a Christian? Paul replied, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, a Christian, except for these chains. Well, that uh, is going to end Paul's hearing uh, before Agrippa, uh, because at this point, Agrippa leaves the room, uh, and the governor and Bernice follow him out. Uh, if you remember, uh, when, when Paul first became a Christian, maybe I guess before he became a Christian, God appeared to Ananias, uh, the Christian who uh, prayed for Paul to receive his sight. And God told Ananias that Paul is, I've got a, a plan for Paul, that he's going to, to go before uh, the leaders of the Gentiles and the kings uh, in order to to tell uh, people about Jesus. Uh, and so here we have at least the first fulfillment of this, uh, that Paul, even before the king of the Jews, uh, is hoping to convince Agrippa uh, to follow Jesus, uh, but that it does not find a receptive audience, it appears. Well, uh, we, we, I mentioned it a minute ago, they said, well, we don't have anything, he hasn't done anything, but he's appealed to Caesar, so we're going to, to send him to Rome where he can stand trial before Caesar. And so this is going to be the first part of the journey from Caesarea uh, by boat up along the, the coast of Turkey and to the island of Crete. Uh, Paul's traveling with Luke. Uh, we see uh, that this begins, we're in chapter 27 now, we boarded a ship. It tells us that Luke has rejoined Paul in Caesarea, uh, and so we get a very detailed account of the voyage to Rome. Uh, it's actually a, a great uh, account for people who are interested in, you know, first century, uh, nav you know, ship navigation, uh, because Luke gives such great detail about uh, what is going on on this ship. Uh, and he gives you know, a very detailed list of stops along the way. Uh, there's also Aristarchus with him. Uh, now, you may remember Aristarchus is one of the, the group. He's from Thessalonica who had delivered the collection to Jerusalem. It appears that perhaps he has also gotten caught up with this with Paul and also been arrested. Uh, Paul will later talk about him in Rome as his fellow prisoner. Uh, so it seems that in Jerusalem, Paul was not the only one who got in trouble. 
that perhaps Aristarchus, one of his friends, uh, also has been arrested and is going to, to go to Rome as well, as a, as a prisoner, it would appear. Luke is traveling uh, on his own as, uh, you know, giving assistance to, to Paul on the trip. Uh, they, they switch ships at, at Myra uh, to a grain ship, so uh, this time North Africa is really su- supplying uh, Rome with a lot of their grain, so there's this constant flow of uh, ships from North Africa up to Italy, uh, so that's where they, they're able to catch up one of these ships. Uh, but travel doesn't go well. The, the winds aren't in their favor, and they only make it to Crete by winter time. Now, winter on the Mediterranean, there's the danger of storms. Uh, and Paul says, I think we should stop right here. Uh, the ship's pilot says, no, I think we can make it to the next spot. Uh, just we want to get to the other side of the island, and that's a better place to spend the winter. We're not going to make it to Rome, uh, but we can make it a little bit further. Uh, well, as you could see, uh, they're going from Fair Haven uh, to the, the next spot they should go to is Phoenix. Uh, and, and that green line does not go uh, to the other side of Crete, uh, you can tell. So they don't make it to the next port. Uh, they do hit one of these winter storms, a northeaster, a nor'easter. Uh, and spend the next two weeks going uh, wherever that storm sends them across the Mediterranean. Uh, mentioned a couple of things here. Uh, they'd gone a long time without food. Paul stood up before them and said, Men, you should have taken my advice not to sail from Crete. Then you would have spared yourself this damage and loss. But now I urge you to keep up your courage, because not one of you will be lost. Only the ship will be destroyed. Last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me and said, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand trial before Caesar, and God has graciously given you the lives of all who sail with you. So keep up your courage, men, for I have faith in God that it will happen just as he told me. Uh, So we do have this promise from from God. Uh, They're going to survive the storm. Uh, and Paul is going to stand before Caesar. Uh, you know, during the course of this storm, they, they end up throwing all the, the cargo over, all the, the grain, uh, the tackle over. Uh, but they do realize that they're measuring the, the depth and realizing the, the water is getting shallower. They're getting near land. Uh, a little story here, too, where Paul catches some of the sailors trying to sneak off in one of the lifeboats. Uh, and so they end up cutting the lifeboat off and sending it uh, empty so that no one can escape. They're all there to help. Uh, and then just before dawn, this is as they're, they're coming near to land, Paul urged them all to eat. For the last 14 days, he said, you've been in constant suspense and have gone without food. You haven't eaten anything. Now I urge you to take some food. You need it to survive. Not one of you will lose a single hair from his head. And after he said this, he took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. Now, Chris has been talking about the Lord's Supper uh, during our our worship times. Uh, And it's interesting here, we have this series of verbs, took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. Those are the the exact things that Jesus does on the night he's betrayed. He takes bread, uh, gives thanks, and breaks it. So what's, what's going on in this passage? Uh, I, I mentioned last week that, that Luke does see uh, the, the trials of Paul as an echo of the, the suffering of Jesus. And so maybe he's, he's just trying to show here that this, this is still kind of going in parallel, uh, that as Jesus approaches his own uh, execution, uh, that he had this meal where he took bread and gave thanks and broke it. Uh, and Paul, this isn't, you know, he's not doing the Lord's Supper here on the boat, uh, but just showing you the, the highlight, the, the parallels are still there. Or it could be that maybe Paul is. This is uh, the Lord's Supper. Uh, elsewhere in Acts, you know, breaking bread is kind of the, their short, shorthand way of saying uh, taking the Lord's Supper. Uh, when it talks about people breaking bread, it probably means they, they are uh, having 
the Lord's Supper there. Uh, so maybe, you know, maybe this is, he counts 14 days, it's a Sunday, uh, we're going to have the Lord's Supper. That's what we do on the first day of the week. Uh, it's not clear, but it, it seems odd to me that Luke would accidentally put this series of three verbs in a row uh, when the, he knows th- these are the, the exact actions that Jesus said to follow uh, when he did them. Uh, so it's interesting here on the ship. Well, they, they do end up making it to land. They land on this island of Malta just off the coast of Italy. Uh, they're gathering firewood, and Paul is bitten by a snake. Uh, everybody thinks he's going to fall over dead, uh, but he doesn't. And so uh, it's not clear if is this a miracle. Uh, maybe it just wasn't a poisonous snake. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, But there there is miraculous things happening here. Uh, Paul heals the chief's father and many other people on the island. Uh, And they end up spending the rest of the winter here on the island of Malta while they wait for uh, the spring and the the resuming of the travel season. Uh, So they catch a boat and work their way up Sicily, up to Pudioli, uh, which sounds delicious to me. I don't know what that is. and then by la- they travel by land the rest of the way to Rome. Now, Paul is allowed to live under house arrest while he's waiting his trial before Caesar. Uh, and this is going to go on for another two years. So there's two years in Caesarea, now two years in Rome. Uh, he does have some freedom, and Acts 28 gives us uh, an account of how he still is sharing the gospel uh, and sharing with the Jews of Rome. Uh, and I think this gives a, a good summary of the, the pattern we've seen throughout the book of Acts. Uh, Paul goes to the, the, the Jews and shows them how Jesus is the fulfillment of Scripture. And it's the same response he always gets. Some believe, some don't. Uh, and then uh, the book of Acts ends with Paul under house arrest, uh, waiting to appear before Caesar. Uh, And we have to wonder, is this this the end of Acts and the end of Paul? Uh, We'll have to maybe uh, figure that out in a future week. But this will be a good place for us to get to today. Uh, Just to remind you of our chronology. So we had this earlier date uh, of 51 AD. We know Paul was on his second journey uh, around 51 AD. We know from this, this transfer from Felix to Festus, if that, was, if that was in 59, then we'd put two years before that in Caesarea and two years after that in Rome. Uh, so uh, he traveled to Jerusalem in the spring. Uh, so I in Acts, it talks about he was traveling during Passover, which is around this time of year, around Easter, uh, and get, gets to Jerusalem by, pa- by Pentecost. So those are spring holidays. Um, and we know he, he leaves Jerusalem uh, and is traveling to Rome in the fall, doesn't make it there before winter. Uh, so that could have been, if Festus uh, came to power in 59, uh, that would have been the fall of 59. Because... Uh, the, the trial at Fest, before Festus is, you know, first thing in, in his term. Uh, so it put us uh, to around the year 62 when the book of Acts ends. Uh, so I'm not, uh, as you know, not too strict on this dating, but this is maybe a rough idea for us. Uh, next week, uh, I'm going to be traveling. Uh, I'm speaking at a church uh, about our, our work in Southeast Asia. Uh, so you get a special guest teacher. I don't know if I should leave that as a surprise for you or if I should tell you it's going to be Chris, uh, but special guest teacher. Uh, and then uh, after that, uh, we've got a few more weeks to talk about with Paul. And we need to talk about where was he in prison, when and where, uh, because we have all these prison letters and we haven't got to yet. And so we've, we just had four years in prison, uh, in Ces- two in Caesarea, two in Rome. Uh, so we, we need to talk about Philippians, Ephesians, Colossians, Philemon. Uh, Second Timothy also appears to be in prison. Uh, and then we need to talk about First Timothy and Titus. We have seven letters left uh, that we'll get to 
the week after next. Okay? Let's close with this prayer uh, that Paul said to the king, uh, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening to me today may become what I am, a follower of Jesus, except for being in these chains. So that's our, our prayer uh, for the world around us, for our leaders. Uh, we pray that they would be followers of Jesus. Okay. Thank you for your attention this morning. Uh, we'll see you in a couple weeks and continue uh, our study of Paul.